Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute and part of the Christians for Liberty Network. I am your host, Doug Stewart, and I am proud to present to you a second part of a conversation that was really great to have. And I hope you listened to the previous episode. If you didn't go back and listen to the previous episode, you don't have to listen to it in order to gain from this one, which is a second part of the contemporary critical theory conversation I had with Neil Shenvey and Pat Sawyer. And in this episode, the one you're about to listen to, we talk about some positive insights that contemporary critical theory has, how Christians should consider how to engage in it. And then, of course, how do we fight or how do we subvert and how do we get the church to think biblically and in a Christian manner from a Christian worldview and not from a contemporary critical theory worldview. So without further ado, I'm going to just turn over the conversation. But of course, I really hope you'll listen to the previous episode because we talk about what is contemporary critical theory, critical race theory. We talk about queer theory. So I issued a disclaimer for the previous episode, and I can't remember if we got into some things for the second episode, so I'll just issue a disclaimer again. Be sure to listen to this before you listen with kids, because we do talk about gender and sexuality, and we want you to use discretion, and so just a heads up for you. So here's the episode. I want to shift the conversation to maybe something a little bit more positive, and that's a pretty going to be a hard pivot, obviously, here. You do actually have positive insights on what contemporary critical theory has. And you've alluded to those in our conversation already. Do you want to share a bit more about like, what can we actually glean from them as far as insights go? Not as in like, hey, this is a tool that we can now use and incorporate because you've already kind of demolished that idea because we can't buy into this whole hog, but nothing is without some kernel of truth. Where are the kernels that you've sifted through? I'll just say two things quickly. Critical race theory helps us be reminded about our racialized history. It's very concerned about that. And it's yeah. very concerned about how de jure racism, for instance, has been de jure codified into law, how racism has been codified into law historically. And that's something to give some thought to. I would say that many of us need to give more thought to our racialized history. Most people in this country do. And so critical race theory helps point to that. Another thing that's discussed in critical social theory is the fact of cultural and social power who has cultural power, and how is cultural power realized? How is it attained? How is it manifested? How is it reified and reinforced in society? And critical social theory gives us a good look at cultural power and societal power and various artifacts that track with social power and who has access to those artifacts, those cultural artifacts in society. And those things are healthy to, to think about. That's another positive. Neil, you can name a couple as well. Sure, I'd just name two others. One would be the critical race theory. One of the things that affirms very clearly is that race is a social construct. And as Christians, we should say, yeah, amen to that. It is. You know, we create these buckets of black and white and Asian. You know, Bible recognizes ethnicity and tribe and family. Those are categories the Bible recognizes. I doesn't really have a category for modern race, like all these people are black because of the color of their skins. We can talk about ancestry is a real thing. Like some people's ancestors came predominantly from Africa or from Asia, sure. But having these just gigantic buckets, you know, I think Asian, this is my favorite one, Asian. You're like, oh, that guy's Asian American. The yeah, Asian is a continent with like 4 billion people in it. So <laughs> what does it tell you that we, we have this category that is meaningful, that, oh, they're Asian. What ethnic, linguistic... <laughs> Similarities is, is a person from, you know, urban Japan, Kyoto. That's even less helpful with some, than saying the Chinese language because China has many languages. It'd be like identifying people like, oh, they're American, meaning from North or South America. Oh, they're from the Americas. Like, what does that tell me? And yet we think it's so meaningful to yeah, say oh, that right. they're Asian American. Like, <laughs> anyway, so critical race theory, if people say, well, critical race theory is 100%, just nothing but lies. Well, ironically, when you say that, you're not going to understand why people are attracted to it. That's not the way that these theories work. They appeal to people because in part, they present you with partial truths. So when you hear things like race is a social construct, that's actually true. So you don't want to be naive and say, well, it's all just 100% garbage and falsehoods because that's, you're missing out why people say, oh, no, that, actually, that's true. I never thought about that. 
And another thing that critical race theory does is it questions and problematizes colorblindness. And we got to be careful here because in some sense, colorblindness can be a good thing. We want to treat everyone equally, regardless of the shade of your skin, yes. But on the other hand, in, as Pat said, a racialized society mm -hmm. where race does lead to discrimination, we shouldn't be blind to it. I and mean, here's a simple example. In 1870, a few years after emancipation, do you really want us to turn around and say, well, now, so you're all free now. So let's just ignore black and white and just we're all colorblind now. Well, clearly you were enslaved five years ago. There are going to be repercussions that are going to be felt in a racialized sure. way. Yes, of course, there are a handful of free blacks who are not enslaved. There are absolutely still poor whites who are living very impoverished lives. And yet there is a divide along racialized terms because of our country's very recent sin. And even today, we're still seeing the after effects of centuries of slavery and Jim Crow that do impact people generally along racialized lines. So we should acknowledge that. We don't have to pretend that a black person is not black, or black, but in quotes if you want to, or white person is not white. We can acknowledge that and still hold up that ultimately, especially for Christians, our primary identity, how we relate to other people as fellow believers, say, or as non-Christians. Our primary identity is not found in race or ethnicity or in gender even, it's primarily found in our identity in Christ. So and we want to point out that, yes, you know, critical race theory is right to say that colorblindness can be problematic if it's used to ignore racism or it's used to maybe to say, you know, don't, I want to hear about your black culture. Well, black culture, there's in some sense in which their culture is meaningful and, and a good thing. You can embrace aspects of every culture and say these are actually good and morally at least neutral aspects that you can celebrate and not just write them off as that, oh, that's too racialized, it's racial. It's fine to say, you know, if you're part of like a subculture in Portland, that's part of who you are, and it's a fine thing. Of course, some things have to be critiqued, other things don't. But the bottom line is that colorblindness is a complex term, and we, in our book, parse the ways in which critical race theory does have some helpful insights into what colorblindness means. So colorblindness is one of those things where I would say most people listening to this would say colorblindness is a good thing to pursue. Mm -hmm. We think of Martin Luther King, the content of our character, not the color of our skin, that kind of thing. And it's a little bit challenging to hear that colorblindness isn't the solution to like understanding racism. But, you know, I take your point on that with how you describe it in the book. Obviously, it's several pages longer than what you just described. What are some of the other things that you say that critical, contemporary critical theory, I got to repeat that the entire time in this conversation, that contemporary critical theory has to offer that might be a challenge to more conservative or classical liberal Christians. One other thing we talk about, which is related to queer theory, but not obviously part of queer theory, is the idea of intersex. So a lot of times, one of the wedge issues that LGBTQ activists use to sort of open people up to the idea of beyond the gender binary and transgender is the issue of intersex people. So people, intersex is a category, a broad category, that includes people whose sexual characteristics don't fall neatly into either male or female. So there are medical conditions where infants are born and the doctors can't quite tell whether they are male or female because their genitalia just don't look typically male or female. There are a variety of conditions that can cause this. And so what transgender activists do is they use that. It's very rare. It's at one in 2,000. The actual numbers are around one in 2,000. Infants are born. You have to call in a specialist to determine their sex. But that very rare case is then used to argue, well, actually, there are a million genders or there are a hundred genders. And intersex is just showing you that biological sex is not binary. Well, that's just not true. The simple explanation is, so if biological sex is male or female and it's expressed in a social category of gender, so what is intersex then? Intersex is someone who does not really neatly fit into the sex binary, male or female, and because of that, it's unclear the social category they belong to. So this doesn't call into question the idea that there are only two genders. It just shows you that there are people who don't fit neatly into the biological category and therefore can't be classified mm. easily in terms of social category either. This does not bring down the gender binary. Yeah, right. But the point is these people exist. They're real human beings made in God's image with a medical condition. And therefore, they raise legitimate questions like, well, how should they be treated with love, compassion, respect, dignity? The Nashville Statement, which is a conservative evangelical statement on gender and sexuality, has a great affirmation on intersex 
people and just affirms that they can be believers. They're beloved of God. Yeah. They can live out a full Christian life. But it, it's worth acknowledging this category of people. It does exist. We can't ignore them just because they make us uncomfortable thinking about, well, where do they fit in terms of gender categories? It's yeah. good for Christians to be pushed on that issue and say, hey, hey, these people do exist. It's a rare condition. And yet, let's think about how to view them. Again, obviously, they're deserving of respect and love. But where we think about them in terms of like ethical questions, open question. Another thing that I would mention is we do get into Pierre Bordeaux's work around cultural capital, like I've already mentioned that concept. And we speak about some of what he has says quite favorably because it's prescient and it's insightful. Adjacent to that is this notion of white privilege. And people that are conservative, Neil and I are certainly conservative, but people that would be classed as strongly anti-woke at times don't want to hear anything about white privilege. They reject mm -hmm. it or deny its existence. And that's absurd in a white majoritarian culture that we're in with the legacy of racialized history that we've had. White people do have some privilege that attend to that. And we honor that, we acknowledge that, and we talk about that. That doesn't mean that there's always a moral breach when white privilege is in play. It emphatically doesn't necessarily mean that. It could mean that in a certain context of situation, but it does not necessarily mean that. With that said, we still have to understand, well, how are these dynamics in play at time and space on the ground in society? And thoughtfulness around that can press some people that like to identify as being majorly anti-woke and having some biggest of self-inventory and taking an honest assessment of one's life in the context of our culture. If you're white, that can be a little bit difficult at times. And we actually encourage that the tenor of our book is to think thoughtfully about these issues and not just reject them out of hand because it seems like something that someone who's very conservative ought to do. Yeah. There's a sense in which, Doug, and you realize this, that we're an equal opportunity offender in certain ways with our... Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we're, we're strongly net critical of critical social theory. It's absolutely incompatible with Christianity in a robust way in the main question. We are overt and, and strong about that. At the same time that we are about nuance where it is needed and where it is right and accurate, and that will offend people on both the right and the left. Yeah. Well, no, you're right. And I think it's important as we have this conversation about the church that both the left and the right need to be confronted because we're all, we all can be complacent in what we're, what we believe. And we can just, oh, well, that's just anti-woke or that's just woke or that's just anti-woke or they're just a bunch of bigots. Or when you get these words thrown at you, like white supremacist or white fragility, or, oh, you're just, think of any term that you want to throw at each other, we can be like, oh, well, fine, I'm just not going to listen to you and I'm just going to stick to my beliefs and so forth, which is why your book is really important because it does offend both sensibilities. I mean, if we had more time, I'd challenge you on a couple things that I had thoughts of, um, <laughs> which well, I kind of mentioned the colorblindness thing. I wasn't quite in alignment with you, although I understood your point. But one of the reasons that I wanted to have this conversation with you guys is this is pervading the church. And with limited time here, why is there an appeal in the church? And what are some things that will counteract this? How do we counteract it? Actually, let me, let me ask it this way. How does this show up in many churches? We already mentioned the racial conversation piece, which is very much on all of our minds in a lot of ways for many reasons. But how will it manifest itself in any of our churches? And then what do we do about it? Is there a way that we can even counteract it, subvert it, undermine it, question it, get people to stop thinking about it? What do you have to say there? So in chapter one, we go through just a litany of manifestations of wokeness in our culture and then in the church. We, we just cite books that are, you know, there are dozens of books that are written from this critical social theory perspective. Now, they won't say that. They won't say, oh, we're doing critical theory. Occasionally they will. But most of the time, these Christian authors are not citing critical race theorists directly. Mm -hmm. What they are right. doing is these Christian authors are citing other Christian authors who are citing other Christian authors who are citing critical race yeah, theorists. Yeah. So this idea, it's called idea laundering, that the ideas pass through this filter, then when they get really far downstream, you don't know where they came from. So a number of again, Christian and evangelical authors have books they've written that they're incorporating these ideas from critical social theory. 
So they're being injected in the church through explicit well, whole books, buckling treatments of things like race, gender, and justice. The people are very, they're very popular. A good example. And then, unfortunately, some of these figures began as evangelical and have either become very progressive in their faith or even have abandoned Christianity. The prominent example that we cite in our book is Dr. Christina Cleveland, who wrote a book in 2022. So in 2013, she wrote a book called Disunity in Christ, which is actually a pretty moderate book about the need to pursue unity in Christ that transcends politics and race and ethnicity. And she was lauded by evangelicals. She wasn't evangelical. She had a column in Christianity Today. She spoke at Campus Crusade for Christ, her crew. She spoke at InterVarsity. So she's a major evangelical figure in the racial reconciliation conversation at the time. In 2022, so only nine years later, she published a book called God is a Black Woman. And it is completely now embraced. I mean, she calls herself basically a pagan witch. <laughs> she uses those terms. She worships the, in her quote, the sacred black feminine. The book is framed around her journey to France where she goes and sort of worships black Madonna statues as the embodiment of the sacred black feminine. So she completely rejects what she calls white male God, single word, who's oppressive and who is basically the biblical God. So that's an extreme example, but she credits her transformation in a talk in 2021, I think, 2019. But she talks about how critical race theory is behind her understanding of not just race, but gender and sexuality and transgenderism and all those other things. And she thinks that critical race theory teaches is an oppressive ladder with rich white men at the top and black trans women at the very bottom. And she has a whole lecture on this. So this is the natural, logical consequence of embracing critical race theory. This is where this will lead you inevitably if you're consistent with its core tenets. So we're seeing this injected not just like covertly, implicitly, but very overtly by a number of people, even professing evangelicals. Mm -hmm. And how do you counteract it? I think, well, that's why I wrote the book. We wrote the book because sure. we want Christians, number one, to be able to spot the ideas. So we don't want them to simply know that there's something out there. I mean, most Christians at this point realize that there's something out there that's, that's not good. Yeah. If they don't quite know what it is, then they have this reflexive knee-jerk response yeah. like, oh, it's woke, it's cultural Marxism, we don't, but we don't really know what it is. And, yeah. therefore, and sometimes you're kind of trying to do, as Pat sometimes says, we're trying to do open heart surgery with a hand grenade. You know, we just lob <laughs> these bombs and trying to fix the problem. And like, yeah, we're, 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 people are getting wounded with the shrapnel. We want to be precise and say, no, this is exactly the problem. Let's cut it out. We don't want it in there. Let's not like damage all the surrounding healthy tissue. Let's actually, and there's yeah. also then bandage the wound and apply biblical remedies and treat this problem using the insights and the commands of God and scripture. Hey folks, I just want to take a break from our episode to ask you to consider becoming an LCI insider. We want everyone to feel engaged and excited about what LCI is doing. And the best way to do that is if you become a monthly supporter at $20 or more per month, you will become what we're calling our LCI insiders. You get some free gifts. You get an exclusive Christ is King magnetic lapel pin. We give you two copies of Faith Seeking Freedom. We send monthly eBooks months ahead of when they're released on our public website. You can get discounts on our swag on our online store, and you get exclusive invites to our quarterly live streams with the LCI staff. In addition to that, whenever we do publish something like a physical book like Strangers with Candy, we'll also send you those as well. So the best way to stay up to date on what we're doing and to support what the Libertarian Christian Institute is doing, including supporting the podcast you're listening to right now, is to become an LCI insider. So to do that, go to libertarianchristians.com slash donate and then choose recurring monthly gift and you'll be added to our list automatically. Thank you for your support and I'll let you get back to the podcast. You know, when you read the beginning of a book and it says, hey, we're going to describe contemporary critical theory and then we're going to critique it and then we're going to offer some thoughts on how to engage it. And usually when I read those kinds of books at the beginning, it's kind of like, okay, you're going to, you know, your publisher asks you to add a chapter so that it could be practical and useful. Yeah. You guys are not, this is not what this book is because I, I want to sort of defend the possible presumption that people are reading this book thinking, oh, I don't really need to learn about critical theory. I need to learn how to engage in my church. You're going to get that because it's actually a pretty substantial section of the book on what do you do in your church? Everything from like church discipline to how do you 
handle what do you say, what do you think, and how do you approach your pastor if he gets up on Sunday morning and says, we need to talk about race issues more? And that's a very practical question because as soon as anybody, especially a leader in the church, says our church hasn't done a good enough job of discussing racial reconciliation or racism in the church or whatever, that could be a signal one way or another. It could be a legit, maybe that guy read your book and is saying, man, I'm convicted that we don't talk about racism enough in my very white church. Mm. Or maybe they read Jamar Tisby. We don't know. So how should a layperson actually respond when they hear a church leader talk about something that eh, could sound like they've gone down the religious track of the person you just mentioned, I forget that per- her name, or maybe they're just followers of Neil Shenvey and Pat Sawyer and they want to do honest history, honest theology, and honest racial reconciliation. I wanted to mention two quick things, and because there's several things that we mentioned, but two quick things in terms of how critical social theories impacting the church or your question just a minute ago. One of the things is the focus on ethnic pride and our ethnic identity as being a lead definer of our identity. And that can supplant the biblical reality that our identity in Christ must be what is our lead identity marker. And so that Mm, is one of the, the ways that critical social theory is affecting the church as people now are looking to their ethnic identity, even their skin tone, as something to rally around and understand how to live out their life relative to the relationships that they're building, that becomes a top identity marker. And that can work against the notion that our identity in Christ must supersede every other identity marker that we have. And then the second thing is critical social theory is about the emancipation of the marginalized and disenfranchised from negative temporal conditions. And so everything is focused on the temporal, on deliverance from oppressive conditions in time and space in the earth. And that can get in the way of the concern, the first concern, that it doesn't matter if we gain the whole world and forfeit our soul. We have Mm, got to have spiritual deliverance as our top primary concern. That doesn't mean that Jesus is not interested in justice, temporal issues. He certainly is. And we talk about that. And Christians must be about that. Matthew 25, we must be about that. As we live out our faith, we're going to be concerned about people's temporal conditions. But we cannot let that take prominence and priority over soul issues. And Neil and I see various ministries that used to really be about orthodox theology and soul issues now shifting that the primary and almost the only thing that they talk about is emancipating those who have no power and giving them power. And that's a concern for the church. Yeah, yeah. So as we discuss, like, how should we approach our leaders if we hear them sounding woke or not? Like, what do you think to that experience? We say in the book, number one thing to do in all situations almost is ask questions. So when your pastor utters the word oppression or justice, You don't immediately jump down their throats and assume the worst and say, oh, they're just repeating talking points from Robin DiAngelo or even Rex Kendi. You just invite them to coffee and say, hey, you used the word oppression. What did you mean by that? Ask a lot of questions like, well, who's a good source that you'd appeal to 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 understand what you mean, how you think about social reality? Those questions are are crucial. That's for church leaders, for anybody. And then another thing we really stress in our book is the need for dialogue at an intra and inter-church level. So we want to encourage Christians to talk to each other who are on different ends of the spectrum in terms of wokeness and critical theory. Now, we're not saying, by the way, that everyone's equally right. We're not not saying that. Clearly, we're saying if you're embracing critical theory, you're wrong. But we want the (laughs) average Christian, we want the average Christian to be able to see both sides. But we're seeing today in our culture and even in the church, you're having these discussions where it's really, it's a panel on race and you have five woke Christians or you have five anti-woke Christians and you're only hearing from one side. And the average Christian is just tuning into the side of the debate that they agree with already. So they're never having their perspectives challenged. So we believe in just a general principle is that the pursuit of truth is aided best and facilitated best by dialogue. Put people up on stage and have an actual honest debate or a conversation where you both defend your own views and examine them in the light of scripture. And that's going to force the audience to hear both sides 
that ask who has the Bible on their side, but whose claims are best supported Mm -hmm. by scripture and by objective evidence. And within a church, obviously, you have to constrain that conversation with like a statement of faith. So you can't have a dialogue where one person is denying the Trinity and the other person is affirming it, and then you have a dialogue. No, there's certain confessional boundaries for every church that says, well, here's what we all believe. Within that context of your statement of faith, now you, but you think differently about, say, race than I do. Great. Let's have a dialogue either publicly or in, in a small group and try to figure out what does scripture say? What is the truth of the matter? And uh, the last thing I'd say is that that should happen again at a church level. We do say, though, that the leadership of the church, so the elders, the pastors, they have to be in agreement on this stuff. It's usually not, you don't have a statement of faith that talks about where you stand on critical race theory. You don't have that in a church statement of faith <laughs> yet. Maybe there will be some ecumenical I'm sure, one I'm day. sure there are churches that do. That have, yeah. Right. They may you, not label it side. that way because they don't want to be pigeonholed. But yeah. Right. But the point is, we do think that it's important, especially today in our culture, for church leaders, church teachers, church elders, church pastors, to get together as an elder team, as a pastor team, and decide what they actually believe about the stuff and not just sweep it under the rug. Because as we show in the book numerous times, yeah. these ideas are going to incubate and germinate and fester until you do end up pushing people outside the bounds of orthodoxy. So it's time to address it now in the church leadership and in the church and the community before yeah. it, it goes into really bad directions. Well, then that, that makes me want to ask you, what do you think of the SBC's Resolution 9? So yeah, I actually got a lot of flack for supporting Resolution 9 when it came out. And and the reason was, though, because I looked at the actual text and the actual text of the resolution, it says some things I disagree with. So for example, it calls critical race theory an analytic tool. And I said, well, that's not good language. Uh, It talks about how it was co-opted by secular worldviews. I said, no, it's not co-opted by secular worldviews. It was based (laughs) in a secular worldview from the outset. But the other things it said, so that's, I was open at the very beginning. I was like, those are not true things, but the net benefit was that they touched on numerous statements that I myself have made in numerous talks about how we have to prioritize our unity in Christ first. Race and sexuality are different things. You cannot say that race and gender and sexuality are all just equal axes of oppression. They denied that. <laughs> so I want to push back on that. And my argument was read the text itself. And a lot of what they said, the net benefit of that resolution was it undermined a lot of what critical race theory teaches. And they had the same criticisms that I do. What I didn't say was I wish they'd said more. I wish they'd talked okay. more about the problem of critical race theory, not less. And actually, I think in 2020 or 2021, the six SBC presidents and J.D. Greer, who was an SBC president and is our pastor, actually, passed a statement repudiating critical race or intersectionality, just saying flatly, it's bad. The gospel is the right way to approach race and not critical race theory. So I think there has been growth in the SBC and recognizing how bad this stuff is. And people like J.D. Greer and Danny Aiken, who's a Southeastern president, they endorsed our book, basically saying, yeah, this is actually correct. They're yeah. thinking about these things properly and they are right to repudiate critical race theory. All right, one more question. You guys talk a little bit about classical liberalism and free speech as part of the counter to this, because honestly, it's become very difficult to even have a voice in the broader culture. Thankfully, still in churches, we tend to be able to listen to each other, at least in, at least allegedly, and at least in spirit. But it's very problematic that most of the time, people who are sort of become woke indoctrinated didn't really hear opposing views. And you guys talk about that in your book. But you make a comment near the end about how classical liberalism and liberalism, while consistent with Christian thinking in many ways, isn't sufficient to really fight this. And why is it that Christians have an advantage in fighting against racism and fighting against critical consciousness and all of that? I'll let you, uh, we'll wrap up with that part of the conversation. The first thing I would mention is that while we are generally pro-classical liberalism in certain ways relative to a non-theocratic society that we are in because we are pro that because classical liberalism, liberalism is pro free speech and then free inquiry and then cognitive liberty. And for Christians in the context of a pluralistic culture, we need that. <laughs> we need to be able to have a culture and a society that has collective goods in terms of how it's running itself that will provide space for free speech, free inquiry, and cognitive liberty because Christians are going to be bringing a counter narrative 
to a lot of secular ideas. And so we need space for that. And then also, we believe that all truth, if it's actually truth, is God's truth, no matter its secondary or tertiary epistemological location. So we don't need to fear truth that's coming from kind of a secondary location, a secular location, if it's actually truth, is God's truth ultimately. So we need to be able to be in a space when we can herald those kinds of things. But we do think that classical liberalism is attempting to fight critical social theory with tools that are ultimately deficient because they are approaching wokeness or critical social theory in a way that is fundamentally flawed. And their classical liberalism doesn't have the firepower and the tools to actually supplant something that is connected to meta narrative and worldview. So it's approaching a, a okay. gunfight with kind of knobs and deficient yeah. weapons. Well, and classical liberalism is is sort of I wouldn't say designed. Maybe it's designed to make room for meta narratives that mm -hmm. people can select, basically. Which is from the conservative side, that's actually a critique of liberalism. That's a whole different conversation, obviously. Uh, Neil, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I just think it's, yeah, it's, in, as Pat said, it's insufficient because you're fighting against uh, essentially a religion. So you're asking an officially neutral procedural enterprise like classical liberalism to fight a religion, which it won't do. Like, it's, 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 I, right. I, you know, it's, it's uh, in, yeah. in principle, the, the, con, the conceit of classical liberalism isn't totally neutral. Now it's not, but the idea yeah. is it's supposed to be. But now you can't press it in a service to defeat what is essentially a religion. You can't do that. It won't do that. So we need to combat religions and meta narratives and worldviews with other, better, truer religions, meta narratives, and worldviews. So that's why we think the Christian has an advantage over the classical, secular, classical liberal, because we understand that ultimately the appeal of critical theory, it's a religious appeal. It's giving you meaning, it's giving you purpose. It's helping you feel like you're good, you're righteous, you're on the right side of history, you're part of the winning team, you're on the side of the oppressed, you're working for justice, you're fighting evil. That's heady stuff. That's attractive. It's totally misplaced and wrong. But we understand the appeal of it. And we just would say Christianity offers the true view of reality that gives you an equally compelling, a more compelling narrative, but not one that puts you at the center, but puts God at the center and makes is mercy the center of your story, not your own awesomeness and your own righteousness. Yeah. So yeah, that's just why we think it's so it's such a important to have a Christian voice speaking against critical social theory because we have tools that classical liberals and secularists don't have. Yeah. Well, guys, your book, Critical Dilemma, The Rise of Critical Theories and Social Justice Ideology, Implications for the Church and Society. What a title. It is amazing. It was one of the top two books that I was looking forward to being published this year in 2023. And where can people buy it? That would be the instant question. I'll put a link in the show notes page for that. But where is the best place for people to buy it? Amazon. Just go to Amazon, Amazon. and pre-order it. Yeah. Anywhere Excellent. books are sold. Isn't that a, a anywhere, anywhere where good books are sold. <laughs> and what was your second book, Doug? I'm interested. Oh, N.T. Wright has an updated translation of his uh, New Testament coming out in a few weeks. Hmm. Okay. So uh, I, was, I was excited to hear that. In, in fact, this was number one until I heard that that was happening a few weeks ago. And I was like, oh man, Neil and Pat just got demoted to number two. <laughs> <laughs> well, you two ride as a force, so we can appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Well, I appreciate you guys joining me for this conversation. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Not just your time, just now. But you guys committed a significant part of your lives to writing this book, which I'm sure had different effects on your family life and other things. And so you've sacrificed in a number of ways for all of us to have a really good resource. I appreciate that. And of course, your time in this conversation. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. 
The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Hello, everyone. It's Doug from the Libertarian Christian Podcast. You might notice already that this recording sounds quite a bit different from usual. In fact, it probably sounds pretty crappy. Well, I'm doing this to show you something pretty amazing. As you might know, the guys over at Podsworth Media have been producing my show for several years, quite a while, hundreds of episodes. And now they have a brand new online app for taking rough recordings like this one and making them sound a whole lot cleaner and a lot more listenable in just a few easy clicks. So here are some of the core features. They remove background noise. It reduces plosives, which is really handy for me because I often forget to put my pop filter on before I do a YouTube video. I often forget to put my pop filter on before I do a YouTube video because pop filters look terrible when you're on camera. It fixes clipping. It removes clicks and pops. It fixes clipping. It removes clicks and pops. It evenly levels dialogue so that you don't have somebody talking really quietly. And then somebody talking really loud because they're too close to the mic or too far away from the mic. It evenly levels dialogue so that you don't have somebody talking really quietly. And then somebody talking really loud because they're too close to the mic or too far away from the mic. How do you use it? It's easy. You go to podsworth.com. You click get started. And because you're a listener to one of the Libertarian Christian Institute's podcasts, you can get 50% off your first order by entering the promo code LCI50. That's LCI50 and you will get 50% off your first order. If you are doing anything like a podcast, a video, a sermon, an audiobook, anything that's spoken word, you want to use podsworth.com and clean up your audio to be even more professional and polished. You want to use podsworth.com and clean up your audio to be even more professional and polished.